Deadly Northern Lights by Thin Red Line Games, my second playthrough of the Gates of Fire scenario using the full rules this time. Um, so I'm just doing the air superiority um, decisions for turn two and um, the Warsaw Pact have to go first and decide on an air superiority area and I just wanted to talk <clears throat> just you know about some basics of the of the decisions because all these decisions get quite interesting so at the end of the last turn the first um, NATO turn NATO um, this task force dropped three supply using amphibious uh, landings into this hex and then some seeking helicopters from the invincible carrier in there to transport that um, supply into this airfield then they used some Hercules transports to bring another three supply into this airfield so that it now has six supply in here. And six supply is enough to make an airbase operational for NATO purposes. So at the moment this airbase would only act as a supply source for Norwegian units. But, uh, but six supply makes it a general supply source for NATO. So we've made this base uh, airbase operational. So having done that, um, NATO, the British ferried in two Buccaneer um, naval bombers with uh, long range and standoff capability and nine four naval bombers, nine evade, four strike value. You know, not incredible, but nine evades quite nice for a for a bomber unit and four strikes good enough to present something of a threat to this task force if it's not protected. So the Warsaw Pact, aware of that, would like to shut this um, airfield down. So they could do that by establishing air superiority in the area. And then, you know, they'd have intercept capability on anything launching out of that airfield. Um, so that might be one option for them. They'd like to harass this British task force if they could. Um, and so obviously having air superiority in there would then give them free escorts, you know, ongoing escorts for any naval bomber missions they try to run in against this task force, which would be good for them. But they'd also quite like to protect their submarines um, from harassment. Um, and the reason, uh, the reason air superiority does that is because it prevents your opponent putting down submarine or naval surveillance markers so if they had air superiority in these areas then NATO couldn't have anti-submarine markers in those areas which are otherwise very likely to go in. So something of a um, you know four mega hexes that they'd like to have air superiority in and only two markers are uh, obviously the the NATO are not going to be foolish enough to give them a free marker by putting them in any of these areas. So the, the NATO air superiority marker will go in somewhere. They will be looking for somewhere that f that forces the Warsaw Pact to commit, um, commit resources but doesn't actually do them any good. Possibly like a mega hex like here where you might then pretend to threaten a strike mission against um, this, you know, this, this depot or, um, or this naval unit here, although that will probably be gone. But it looks like it's incoming with um, supply t to go into these, um, uh, into these guys. So, um, yeah, you might threaten that and of course you can run air missions during your opponent's movement phase so I think um, I think NATO would quite like the look of um, dropping their air superiority marker in here um, but of course it gives the Warsaw Pact an option to say okay then and divert some fighter squadrons in there and therefore protect that um, protect that for free whereas if they didn't do that then they'd simply have to run an intercept with much less chance of success. So it's there are quite difficult um, or interesting, I should say, and um, thought-provoking um, um, options for e either side in this process. Um, I think the Warsaw Pact is going to start by 
shutting down this area or, or or threatening to shut down this area so the placement of the markers doesn't mean you've committed any aircraft it just means that you're saying where you want air superiority be, to be contested NATO then get to place and I think I've just talked myself out of this because we might run that mission and try and sink that transport and force the uh, Warsaw Pact to try and intercept without air superiority. Um, we don't want to choose any of these areas because we simply can't support some sort of air superiority idea. Um, you know, we're just we're just giving the Warsaw Pact a free option to establish air superiority in an area where they don't place the marker. So I think it will have to be like up over here or something, you know, somewhere just randomly out of the way and we'll make the Warsaw Pact place another marker. And they'll let their subs um, fight their own battles I think and so they'll drop their other air superiority in here and see if they can't hassle the uh, the British fleets yeah so now what happens is that both sides get to place um, naval um, their naval and anti-submarine surveillance markers um, obviously NATO will not place them in areas where they could lose air superiority so they will put their anti-submarine in here with the Russian submarines and in here with the Russian submarines and they will put their naval surveillance it's interesting where to put their naval surveillance um, They've got an airbase here, so they've got no real restrictions in terms of where they can go up in the Barents Sea. I think it makes sense possibly to run them in here and here and see. Yeah. Yeah, that probably makes the most sense. <clears throat> the idea being that... Um, I think this guy would have to go through this naval, this mega hex to get out. Um, and this task force is going to have to. And if we do manage to get out of this airbase, then we'll want to be intercepting up over there. So we'll give that a go. Um, the Warsaw Pact anti submarine and naval surveillance is likely. Well, the anti-submarine, they will want to cordon off this area from any <clears throat> any British submarines arriving. So they'll put their anti-submarine wall surveillance in there. Naval, though, is a bit more difficult. Um, we're not quite sure what the NATO navies are doing. Um... But given that we want to run some early missions against that British task force, if we've got air superiority and naval surveillance, that will give us a detection level of two. That will give us a lot of power to go in and try and find and attack that task force. And then I guess <coughs> the other one... The other one probably comes in here uh, and yeah we'll try that we'll try that so the Russians the Warsaw Pact really trying to uh, in fact maybe in here the Warsaw Pact just really trying to lock down air superiority and naval superiority and anti-submarine um, capabilities all in this all in this approach to the theatre um, and make life as hard as possible for for NATO to get 
any forces into the area without it um, facing significant challenge. So yeah, let's do that. And we are now into the process of assigning um, aircraft into those air superiority areas. Um, now I know for a fact that NATO won't commit any because they haven't got, <laughs> they've got nowhere near enough aircraft to challenge. Um, so it's really a question of working out what the Warsaw Pact want to throw into each one. They'll ignore the NATO one out there in the Barents Sea. Um, so it'll just be their two areas, probably four aircraft into each, um, and we'll go from there. End of the second turn here in Deadly Northern Lights, gates of fire, full rules. Um, and we've had some naval casualties, but not a lot else happened. So the um, NATO moved a couple of, um, moved task force in here. The Warsaw Pact had a couple of goes at sending um, air raids against British shipping. Couldn't locate anything. And so um, we had a bit of air to air, well, Unfortunately, we had some air-to-air -air combat in which the British Harriers, based on the Invincible, were shot down, um, trying to intercept. But um, luckily, the the actual um, surface naval vessels weren't located, and so um, no damage done there. However, some submarines did find a British task force and just sunk um, a British frigate at the cost of two Russian submarines and a damaged submarine. So sort of on as, on as even there but we're not happy about the loss of the brazen frigate there and um, the British task force just moved in here Russian submarines attempted to intercept not one of them made a, a successful interception role and so nothing happened um, that move really was to split up firstly to get the task force out of this zone where where the Soviets have air superiority and naval surveillance because they had an automatic detection of two at that point so we moved into a quieter area of the um, Norwegian sea where we weren't so exposed um, and uh, what else to say um, yeah we're trying to amass our our ground forces and stuff here. We've got some helicopters that we've dropped off a, a ship. We've got one transport in there that doesn't have amphibious capability, landing capability, but it's got some troops on it because we didn't have enough with amphibious to land everything. So we've now, next turn, assuming everything survives intact, we've got to transfer some cargo between transports, move those special forces onto a ship with amphibious capability and then uh, drop them off so yeah it's all going to get a bit <laughs> a bit busy in there in turn three um, I'm not even sure we're going to have everything ready to go by turn five to make uh, to make the assault on Tromso but we'll see um, compelling stuff uh, even though not much is happening um, lots of puzzles to solve um, and difficult difficult to uh, operate under such you know um, oppressive sort of air power but um, yeah it, everything feels quite risky <laughs> at the moment for the NATO side they're just like a few bad rolls away from getting lots of things sunk and yeah it's all really all really sort of scary so um, I'm going into turn three the Russians still have the Warsaw Pact still have everything they want they're holding locations they want they're moving forward in ways they want and they're sending up um, you know, air power to attack things at uh, very little risk to themselves, so um, largely going their way at the moment. Deadly Northern Lights, turn three, gates of fire. I'm just, uh, well, I've just done the air superiority in the um, <clears throat> surveillance areas, and we're going into the Russian turn, um, and we've got bad weather this turn, which is going to change things up. So um, that makes sort of ground strikes and naval strikes a lot, a lot less reliable. Um, and they're pretty unreliable at the moment because you have to make interceptions. Well, now you have, to, you have a 50-50 chance of them just being aborted before you even make the interception. But it also means that this um, cargo transfer that we needed to do for NATO um, to get the f uh, forces onto something with amphibious landing capability can't happen that can't happen in bad weather so that's going to hold the NATO side up 
and it increases the movement cost of naval units, surface naval units moving and other things. So I went to move this damaged submarine. I thought I'd withdraw that. That was a safe first move, I thought. Well, the NATO announced an interception with this ASW surveillance marker and uh, rolled a 17. So that puts um, a detection uh, level of one on the submarine and we roll an attack on it with a strength of six. So I've not seen this before, thought I'd put it on camera because these ASW surveillance markers haven't made the interception rolls. So quick, quick attack on that submarine. Uh, we've rolled a 12. I don't quite think that's going to be enough to do anything um, because we're going to have a minus four for a detection level of one. No modifier for the toughness, but that makes it an eight. An eight on a six. Ooh, just missed. Just missed. Nearly sank it, but not quite. Um, so yeah, uh, nearly a nearly a sunk submarine, but it is going to get out of there um, unscathed. So deadly northern lights. Um, gates of fire. And it's turn four, and uh, turn three was bad weather, and that had significant implications. Two sorties of Warsaw Pact um, bombing attempts against NATO task forces were just aborted without even making search rolls. The um, uh, Warsaw Pact struggled to make any progress over here. These ground troops managed two whole hexes of movement, um, but that was it. And the railroad, the railhead could barely move at all because of the bad weather. And in the seas, um, the Warsaw Pact decided to remain on patrol here and not get their subs lured away into surrounding areas to keep uh, to keep naval control of this or keep naval watch on this area in case of um, NATO sort of attempts to move through it. There was some exchange of um, fire between a UK submarine and a Soviet submarine that resulted in damage to both vessels. Um, and that was about all she wrote. Um, but of course the bad weather also stopped NATO from transferring um, some forces they need onto uh, an amphibious uh, a vessel capable of amphibious landing and so rather sort of stalled out their progress and some Dutch shipping turn just about made it here with some more forces on board and some more supply on board but that was about all they could do and now we've hit turn four and we've got bad weather again and I at that, that point, I started doing some calculations as to whether there was any way of getting NATO forces here to make an assault on Tromso over here. And the answer is essentially no. Um, you know, because the bad weather means they can't get all the troops they need onto amphibious assault vessels, which means they can't even land them all, even if they could. Um, it's four to load and unload two to move in a, he a mega hex in bad weather and four to load and unload and so it would cost 10 naval movement points simply to say unload them over here um, and they've only got nine so they won't even get their forces from here to here in turn four um, let alone start marching them around in bad weather to try and make an attack on Tromso which they will no in no way make um, so I think that, uh, with that realisation that there's no way of getting gro um, NATO ground troops into Tromso now, um, I think that's it. I don't think there's any major point in playing turns four or five. You know, this is just a, a, a strategic um, Warsaw Pact win and there's the, there's very little that, in fact, there's nothing that NATO can do. Um, and one of my learning points from this is that the weather rules, while perhaps interesting if you're playing the campaign game, really do pretty much act as the deciding factor if you play these short scenarios. You know, bad weather on the wrong turn, and you pretty much prevent one side or the other from even contesting the objectives let alone you know having a chance to win um 
So for example, if you got bad weather on first two turns, then then the, the um, Warsaw Pact couldn't possibly do this airdrop in here. And maybe NATO makes it, makes it in there first with some naval forces, though it's possible that, that the Warsaw Pact would get in with um, a naval, navally transported unit, maybe, um, with pre-war movement. I'm not sure, um, because the pre-war movement would barely get them anywhere because mega hexes would be costing two, two in bad weather. Maybe they'd beat NATO there with naval for, with a, a battalion of marines um, as in, in naval movement. Really hard to say, um, but anyway, uh, it would certainly stop this airdrop. It would possibly make things a lot more. Um, a lot more competitive, but certainly bad weather. Bad weather later in the game pretty much stops the stops NATO from doing anything because they're so reliant on amphibious movement, amphibious landings, and it just can't happen in this weather. The ships aren't quick enough, and the loading and unloading is too slow. I think basing here was a uh, was a mistake. Um, I think maybe we could have given ourselves more hopes of achieving something had we moved into this mega hex and um, based our troop landings in here because that is at least on the mainland and we have a, have a bridge and some planes and we could have been somewhere a little bit more useful um, but I still don't think the bad weather would still stop us from amassing sufficient troops to fight this this supplied brigade um, up here in in Tromso. So, um, yeah, really hard to know because um, until you get to that combat and look at all the factors that you can put in, for example, all the sort of naval gunnery factors that the Allies could put in and all the ground strike um, air factors that the Russians could put in until you have that battle and see what it looks like. Um, it's really hard to know how it's going to play out. Uh, certainly can't, certainly can't guess how it's playing out here. Um, but we're not going to get there because any turn of bad weather pretty much stops one side or the other from getting there. So I am going to scrap the weather rules. They are optional, and I'm not going to use them. Um, because I, I I think they 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 act as such a limiter on what is otherwise a really super interesting game. You know the game is sufficiently interesting, with sufficiently fantastic sort of plans and decisions to be made, without then um, just rendering all those plans irrelevant because the weather roll says you can't you can't do what you need to, and therefore you can't achieve any objectives that you need to, and you might as well you know you're you're just sabotaging your own game by the looks of things as far as i can see like i say in the big campaign game where it might give you a pause to reconsider different options or allow you to um switch resources into different theaters or whatever i could see the weather rules being being an interesting factor but here they're just a limiter with very little upside they don't change the decision making progress they just they just end it. So, yeah, um, I'm not playing weather uh, with the weather in these smaller games from now on. I am, however, going to move on to this scenario three against a sea of troubles, and um, that's another five-turn game. We'll be using the full rules, no weather, and we'll see how that goes.